Football, the beautiful game. It brings together people from all walks of life, united for their love of the sport. It is a symbol of national pride and a source of intense passion, capable of invoking a wide range of emotions from sheer exhilaration to profound despair. Yet within this seamlessly harmonious amalgamation of fandom, there lies a darker side, a side married by violence, racism, and hooliganism. This story tells the story of one such group that emerged from this dark underbelly, the infamous Chelsea Headhunters. Born in the terraces of Stamford Bridge in the early 80s, the Headhunters quickly gained notoriety as one of the most violent football hooligan firms in the UK. This story attempts to delve into their origin, their rise, and the event leading to their fall. Not as glorification of their actions, but as an exploration of the social factors that gave birth to such a phenomenon. As we journey through the tumultuous years of the Chelsea Headhunters, we seek to comprehend the complexity of their existence, to scrutinise the factors that fueled their violence, and to understand the events that led to their downfall. This is not just a story of a notorious football firm, it is a chronicle of social dynamics, transformative undercover journalism, and the ongoing struggle to reclaim the beautiful game from the grip of hooliganism. Welcome to the complex, dark, and ultimately enlightening saga of the Chelsea Headhunters. In the cool rainy streets of West London, the 1960s and 70s had brought about a potent mix of change and tradition. It was a time of flux in Britain, and nowhere was more apparent than in the burgeoning football scene. The cultural life of Britain was woven intricately into the fabric of its football clubs, and at the heart of it all, Chelsea Football Club stood as a beacon for the passionate and often rebellious. This was an era when the roots of Chelsea headhunters started to spread. Although their original moniker was something far less menacing, the Chelsea Shed Boys. Named for the shed end of the Stamford Bridge, the traditional home of the club's more ardent supporters, the group was, at first, just a band of passionate fans. But their loyalty was fierce, their presence known. But the dark transformation into what would become one of the most feared football hooligan firms in England was still in its nonsense stage. The Chelsea Shed Boys, much like the club they supported, had their unique charm. Their gatherings were rowdy, raucous and high-spirited, always plustering the raw energy of youth and camaraderie. While they were not yet the notorious headhunters, they were by no means wallflowers. Their chants echoed the Stamford Bridge and their unwavering loyalty to Chelsea began to brew a distinct culture, a sense of togetherness and rebellion that would later form the foundation of the notorious Chelsea headhunters. The rise of the football hooliganism in Britain coincided with the Shed Boys' existence. Football, for many working class Britons, was more than just a sport. It was a way of life, a symbol of the community and solidarity. However, with the intense passion for all their teams, also came the inclination to defend their honour, sometimes violently. Hooliganism started emerging as a significant issue, and its seeds were unknowingly sowed into the heart of Stamford Bridge. The Chelsea Shed Boys, at the forefront of this movement, evolved as the years passed. The spirit of the rebellion grew stronger. The distinction between the passion and violence blurred, and the once rowdy gathering started transforming into something more sinister. However, as the 70s dawned, another cultural phenomenon began taking hold in the UK, the rise of the skinhead movement. Unbeknownst to everyone at the time, the blending of football passion and skinhead culture was about to create a new formidable entity that would shake the very foundations of British football, the Chelsea Headhunters. Little did they know, the heyday of this infamous group was just on the horizon, awaiting for the perfect storm to arise. As chapter 1 concludes, we see the calm before the storm. The Chelsea Shed Boys, innocent in their love for the game, unknowingly stand in the petropies of transformation, unaware of the infamy that awaits them in the heart of the British football culture. As the 1980s began, a ripple ran through British youth culture. The skinhead movement, with its unique blend of fashion, music, and a particular brand of British working class defiance and it was gaining momentum. At the same time, the presence of football hooliganism was becoming increasingly apparent. Against this backdrop, the Chelsea Shed Boys underwent their metamorphosis, emerging as the Chelsea Headhunters. This transformation was not overnight, 
nor was it planned. It was a gradual evolution, a reflection of the times, the environment, and the shifting cultural landscape. The headhunters found themselves at the crux of two potent cultural phenomena, football fanaticism and the skinhead subculture. This combination brewed a new kind of fanaticism on the terraces of Stansford Bridge, one that was prepared to fight for their club, not just on their home turf, but on opposed grounds as well. The headhunters, much like their predecessors, the Chelsea Shed Boys, held a deep and fierce loyalty to their club. However, with the influence of the skinhead culture, their identity started to change. Their outlook, their actions, their attitudes, all began to reflect a grittier, more aggressive stance. The camaraderie of the Shed Boys became an unbreakable bond of the headhunters. The rowdy energy morphed into an aggressive defiance, and their chants on the terraces became war cries, a chilling proclamation of their presence and power. But the transformation brought with it another disturbing element, racism. It was not a trait inherent in the skidhead movement. Still, as the headhunters formed, the predominance of white members and a cultural climate at the time led to a disturbing association. As the National Front, a far-right political group, gained prominence in the late 70s and 80s, the headhunters found themselves pulled into a whirlpool of right-wing extremism. Stamford Bridge, the beloved home of Chelsea Football Club and the Shed Boys, inadvertently became a recruitment ground for the far-right. Every home match saw National Front and British National Party members peddling their newspapers outside the stadiums and in local pubs. As the presence of these groups grew, the image of the Chelsea headhunters began to shift, tainted by the rising tide of right-wing extremism and xenophobia. And so, the transformation was complete. The headhunters emerged, casting a long, dark shadow over the terraces of Stamford Bridge. They were far removed from the Shed Boys of the past. They were more aggressive, more formidable, and more feared. They wore their reputation as a badge of honor, ready to defend their club and their name at any cost. As chapter two draws a close, we find the Chelsea headhunters amidst the storm they've created. Their loyalty to their club remains unyielding, but their methods have shifted, darkened by the political and cultural winds of the era. Little do they know, they're about to step onto the world stage, unprepared for the scrutiny and the repercussions that await them. As the Chelsea headhunters stepped into the limelight of the British football hooliganism scene, a rivaling phenomenon was brewing on the northern terrains of England. The rise of the headhunters did not go unnoticed, nor did it go unchallenged. Their reputation for brutality and intimidation sparked an escalating war of the terraces across the country. The most significant of these challenges was an intimidating group hailing from Leeds, known as the Leeds United Service Crew. The service crew, known for their severe aggression and notorious reputation, saw the headhunters as a threat to their dominance. Thus began a fierce and violent rivalry, which would extend the wall beyond the confines of the football pitch. The 1980s was an era marked by the grim spectre of hooliganism. The brutal battles between the rival football firms became a national concern. These fights, often meticulously planned and executed, weren't just spontaneous brawls. They were well-coordinated skirmishes, making territories, asserting dominance and incurring fear. One such notorious clash occurred on the 13th of March 1982. It was a bitter cold day and the headhunters were on enemy turf, ready to support Chelsea against Leeds United at Ellen Road. What followed was a brutal and bloody encounter that will go down in history as one of the most violent episodes in British football hooliganism. Well, unfortunately, as I'm sure you've seen, it wasn't the football at Stamford Bridge which featured on the sports pages today. It was the scenes before, during and after involving hooligans. 150 were arrested well away from Stamford Bridge when they ran riot on the London Underground. And then another 66 during and after the match, which attracted 25,000, the third biggest crowd of the day. There was trouble in the first half in the main stand when police fought with youths among the seats. Evidence, perhaps, that all-seater stadiums would not be the whole answer to hooliganism. At the end, as youngsters ran onto the pitch, more fighting erupted between youths and police and the lead supporters were locked inside the ground for half an hour. As soon as the Chelsea fans arrived, they were met with a barrage of attacks from the service crew. Bottles and bricks filled the air, turning the once peaceful Yorkshire streets 
into a war zone. The Chelsea headhunters, never once to back down, retaliated in kind, turning the initial assault into an all-out street war. Back in London, the news of the Battle of Ellen Road spread like wildfire. The media swarmed, seizing upon for violence and using it to stroke public outage against football hooliganism. Yet, within the ranks of the headhunters, the battle was worn as a badge of honour, a testament to their resolve and fearlessness. In the aftermath, the media outcry put the Chelsea headhunters squarely in the national spotlight. This visibility brought further challenges and issues, increased police attention, media scrutiny and public revulsion began to cast a long shadow over Stamford Bridge. By the end of chapter 3, we see the Chelsea headhunters caught in the crossfire of their own actions, their fierce loyalty to their club and their aggressive stance has placed them at the forefront of the country's growing battle against hooliganism. As they brace for the fallout, the question remains, how will they navigate the storm they have created? The answers lie in the chapters ahead. In the 1980s, amongst the rampant hooliganism and violent football rivalries, the Chelsea headhunters found themselves pulled into a darker, more sinister direction. The politically charged era provided fertile ground for extreme ideologies, and soon enough, the headhunters found themselves entwined in the dangerous world of white supremacy. In the late 70s and 80s, Groups like the National Front and Combat 18, notorious for their far-right ideologies and racial prejudice, began to infiltrate the terraces. One of the first things the police found when C18 came into existence around 92 was visiting cards from Chelsea uh, headhunter C18. People were assaulted, very seriously assaulted. Pubs were attacked and smashed up with the occupants. Men, women and children were attacked by these gangs and they'd leave behind a calling card that would say you've been visited by Chelsea headhunters Combat 18. So from the very earliest days of Combat 18, the Chelsea headhunters like Frayne and this crew were in there operating with them. In a bar after the game, he describes a visit he and Andy Frayne made to the Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz. There's a, there's a, they're a mature thing, right? And they're talking all these Jerry's about what happened, blah, blah, blah. There he is, Frayne, he said, we'll take a photograph, Taz. There he is. But <laughs> <laughs> well, the Jerry's start going, didn't they? Didn't they? Oh, fuck off, it's what I believe it. Who knows? Yeah, stay down. Yeah. Well, where the turnout? What was it, quick and turn out? A group of the Chelsea headhunters, uh, led by Frayne, uh, paid a visit to Auschwitz concentration camp. I, I got a postcard from them, a uh, picture of the camp. On the back it said, uh, Combat 18, Headhunter Division, wish you were here. We've just dug up the bones of your grandmother and pissed all over them. This is the mentality of these people. I mean, sheer bitter hatred. But the fact is, they do do these trips. If there's a match in Warsaw, they'll make a stop off in Auschwitz. If they're in Germany, I uh, had another card from Dachau. Using football matches as recruitment grounds, they exploited the passion, violence and tribalism already present in football hooliganism to propagate their racist and xenophobic ideologies. The Chelsea headhunters were not immune to this influence. Within their ranks, a fraction began to emerge that aligned with the far-right ideologies, known for their brutal violence and aggression. This fraction amplified the racist undercurrents within the headhunters. They further stained the group's reputation by forging links with the notorious Ulster Defence Association and Ulster Volunteer Force, Northern Irish loyalist paramilitary organisations known for their violence. One of the most visible signs of this alignment was the ever-increasing presence of National Front and British National Party members selling their newspapers at Chelsea home matches. Stamford Bridge had inevitably became a recruitment ground for the far right, tainting the Chelsea fan base with an unshakable association to far right extremism. This political shift within the headhunters escalated their violence and added a dangerous dimension to their activities. Incidents of racially motivated violence began to rise. This culminated in a horrifying incident on the 8th of November 1984 when Kevin Whitten, 
a high-profile member of the Headhunters, was sentenced to life imprisonment for his involvement in a violent assault on an American manager of a pub in Kings Road. Chapter 4 is an exploration of how an already violent group can be lured into a, the terrifying world of extreme ideology. The tale of the Chelsea Headhunters serves as a stark reminder of how easily the passionate love for the football team can be twisted and manipulated into something far more sinister. As we move into the subsequent chapters, we will see how the media and law enforcement began to confront this escalating problem. In the face of escalating violence and growing extremist influence, the police seemed to grapple helplessly with the headhunter's reign of terror. But the tide began to turn in 1999 when a courageous investigator, Donald McIntyre, decided to take on the challenge of infiltrating the headhunters. Armed only with his wits and a Chelsea tattoo for authenticity, Mr McIntyre ventured into the lion's den. His goal was simple yet bold, to expose the hooligans, disturbing truths and break their stranglehold on English football. However, little did he know the risks involved. The headhunters were surprised that Mr McIntyre had chose the Millwall Lion Badge instead of the 1960s Chelsea Erect Lion for his tattoo, a decision that only added to the danger that he was about to face. For months, Mr McIntyre had lived as one of them, witnessing firsthand the brutality, the racism and the links to extremist organisations like Combat 18. He unveiled shocking truths about the group's top rank members, including one who had been in prison for possession of Ku Klux Klan related material. I've got a pocket for the Ku Klux Klan calling cards. That didn't go down so well. <laughs> yeah. That's it. They got us in the towel. His covert operations came to fruition on the 9th of November 1999 when his documentary on the Chelsea Headhunters was screened on the BBC. The broadcast stunned viewers and sent shockwaves through the football community. The footage that Mr McIntyre had gathered led to several arrests and convictions. Amongst the convicts was Jason Mariner, a top-ranking member of the Headhunters. Despite claiming to have been set up by Mr McIntyre and the BBC and asserting that the footage was manipulated, Mr Mariner was convicted and sent to prison. His conviction marked a significant victory against the hooligan fraternity, a first of its kind since the Lampard attempts at undercover work by police 10 years prior. In this chapter, we see a brave individual stepping up to confront the terror, leveraging the power of the media to expose the dark underbelly of football hooliganism. Mr McIntyre's actions were instrumental in triggering a crackdown on hooliganism leading us into the next chapter of our tale, where the fight against the headhunters intensified. The wake of the McIntyre documentary and the subsequent convictions marked a significant blow to the Chelsea headhunters. Nevertheless, Jason Mariner, one of the headhunters convicted and imprisoned as a result of the expose, fought back, penning a book from prison entitled Stitch Up, for a blue soul. In it, he vehemently defends the headhunters, claiming they were set up by Mr McIntyre and the BBC. Following Mr Mariner's release from prison, he became a contentious figure, continuing his association with the headhunters and participating in a creation of the DVD, Jason Mariner's Football Hooliganism directed by Liam Galvin. Despite his conviction, Mr Mariner's influence within the firm retained a stark testament to the enduring nature of the hooligan culture. Simultaneously, the headhunters' nefarious deeds became a source of cinematic fascination, making it to the silver screen in Nick Love's The Football Factory, a film presented a fictionalised account of the headhunters' violent rivalry with the Millwall Bushwhackers. Again, highlighting Mr Mariner's pivotal role within the firm. However, the turning point in the story came with the sentencing of Kevin Whitten, a high-profile member of the firm. In a frenzy of uncontrolled rage after a lost match, Mr Whitten, alongside other hooligans, attacked a pub on King's Road, leaving the American manager, Neil Hansen, close to death. His conviction and life imprisonment later cut to three years on appeal, emphasised the headhunters' whining control and strengthening resolve of the police agencies. As the headhunters grappled with his newfound scrutiny and the resulting pressure, their notorious activities started to diminish. Yet, as we will discover in the subsequent chapters, this decline was far from the end of their tale. The legacy they had created was deeply entrenched in football culture and their violent ethos continued to influence new generations of fans.
Despite the public convictions and highlighted scrutiny, the Chelsea headhunters remained active, albeit less prominently so. The influence and shadow they cast over the football community, however, had far-reaching effects. On the 13th of February 2010, a violent clash between the headhunters and the Cardiff City Soul Crew painted a vivid picture of the firm's lingering presence. The event, a fifth round tie at Stamford Bridge for the FA Cup, spiralled into chaos as the firm clashed with their rivals. Violence ensued, resulting in numerous injuries, including a police officer whose jaw was broken. A year later, 24 individuals were convicted of participating in the violence and received banning orders from all the football grounds in England and Wales. A hefty number of them, 18, were handed prison sentences of up to two years. The headhunters were also involved in premeditated violence in Paris during a UEFA Champions League quarter-final between Paris Saint-Germain and Chelsea on the 2nd of April 2014. Around 300 hooligans wreaked havoc around the city outsmarting law enforcement agencies by entering France via Belgium. Despite these years, the headhunters built alliances with other hooligan firms across the UK. In the year 2000, a temporary union saw them collaborating with Linfield FC, Rangers FC, Cardiff City, Swansea City and Leeds United supporters, led by Arsenal firm The Herd. Their combined aim was to wreak vengeance on Galatasaray fans for a stabbing incident involving two Leeds United fans. These alliances were a testament to the unity within the football hooligan culture and it further exemplified by the mutual respect between the headhunters and West Ham United's inner city firm. This fellowship underscored the pervasive nature of hooliganism within football, proving that the demise of a single firm was not sufficient to eradicate this dark subculture. The story of the Chelsea headhunters did not end with their diminished activities and fractured alliances. As the following chapters will reveal, their legacy, deeply rooted in football hooliganism, continues to echo through the annals of football history and a chilling reminder of the violence that once stained the sport. As we journey back in time to trace the origin of the Chelsea Headhunters, we find ourselves in the late 60s and 70s. Football hooliganism was at its infancy and the Headhunters, initially known as the Chelsea Shed Boys, were emerging as one of the original football hooligan firms in England. During the 80s, football hooliganism reached its peak, with the skinhead movement strongly influencing England's youth culture. A new breed of youth culture began to populate the terraces, and the Chelsea fans seemed prepared to fight any and everybody, especially in the opposition's home end terrace. The skinhead connection of the Chelsea headhunters was not initially associated with racism. However, this changed dramatically towards the end of the 70s and into the 80s, as the National Front gained prominence. Stamford Bridge turned into a recruitment ground for the far right and the Chelsea headhunters became increasingly linked with racism. Despite the evolution and multiple shifts within the firm, one thing remained consistent. The headhunters were almost entirely a white hooligan firm. This chapter in the story paints a troubling picture of the times and offers a deep insight into the political context in which the Chelsea headhunters operated. The headhunters became a part of England's notorious football history a group that incited violence and chaos. Their story not only exposes the dark underbelly of football hooliganism, but also raises a poignant question about the nature of fanaticism and the role of social structures in facilitating such destructive behaviour. The remaining chapters aim to delve deeper into these issues, dissecting the complexities of football hooliganism as embodied by the Chelsea headhunters. The latter part of the 90s saw a notable shift in the public's perception of the Chelsea Headhunters, triggered by a groundbreaking documentary aired by the BBC in 1999. The documentary was the result of a daring undercover operation carried out by an investigative journalist, Donald McIntyre, who posed as a potential Headhunter member to expose the group's violent activities. For authenticity, Mr McIntyre got a Chelsea tattoo, surprising the gang members with his choice of the Millwall Lion Badge over the 1960s Chelsea Erect Lion. The documentary revealed the firm's deep-seated racism and their affiliation with the notorious groups like Combat 18, leading to several arrests and convictions. One of the headhunters' top-ranking members, Jason Mariner, was convicted and imprisoned due to the evidence from the show. 
Jason is excited at the prospect of the game, but he keeps up a flow of racist abuse. Fuck up, you black. Well, they're not the usual up there, mate, today. He fucking got his eyes shut, that old baboon. He thinks he's in the fucking tree. Why you kick my dog, call it fuck off. Mr. Mariner later claimed in his book, Stitch Up for a Blue Soul, that he had been set up by Mr. McIntyre in the BBC. He asserted that the footage was manipulated, incidents were manufactured, and they were convicted despite no footage of them committing any crimes. Following the documentary, the Chelsea Headhunters' violence became less frequent, but their name remained infamous in the world of football. Despite their reduced activities, their impact remained plausible. The Football Factory, a film directed by Nick Love, offered a fictionalised account of the Headhunters' rivalry with the Millwall Dushwackers. Several members of the firm, including Jason Mariner, moved away from their hooligan past. Mr Mariner, in particular, moved to Thailand and opened a shop for expats. However, the controversy followed him when he used an image of Lee Rigby, a British soldier who was murdered in 2013, to express his views, causing outrage and distress to the Rigby family. Despite the efforts to combat football hooliganism, Occasional violent disturbances involving the headhunters have persisted, yet the intensity and frequency of their activities have dramatically diminished. The introduction of all-seater stadiums, improved policing and the fallout from the McIntyre documentary have all contributed to this decline. As we step into a new era, the infamous legacy of the Chelsea headhunters continues to serve as a grim reminder of the darker side of football fandom underscoring the need for constant vigilance to ensure the sport remains safe and inclusive. The story of the Chelsea Headhunters, as with all stories, is one of change. It is a narrative that has evolved over time, influenced by social, political and cultural shifts. It is a story of violence and racism, but also of social tool change and the potential for transformation. It is a stark reminder that, even within the passion and the camaraderie of football, darker forces can emerge. Yet it also speaks of the possibility of change and growth, even from the most notorious origins. Jason Mariner, the former Chelsea headhunter, had recently broke his silence in a candid interview with the author and YouTuber Liam Galvin. Mr Mariner, who was a key figure in the infamous McIntyre expose documentary, was sent to prison as a direct consequence of the film, but until now, his side of the story has remained largely unheard. In the interview, Mr Mariner dives deep into the repercussions of the documentary. The experience, he admits, cost him a great deal. He lost not only his freedom, but also his reputation and relationship. The ramifications of the film extend far beyond his prison sentence, casting a long shadow over his life. The devastation left in the wake of the documentary is tangible, underscoring the enormous price he paid for his past actions. However, the interview isn't solely about a look into his past. Mr Mariner also talks about his journey forward, his commitment to not looking back, but to instead focusing on the future. Despite the adverse outcomes, Mr Mariner is determined to turn the page and embark on a new chapter in his life. He articulates his willingness to accept the consequences of his past actions, his resolve to learn from them, and his aspirations to make a positive change. It is a story of resilience and determination in the face of profound adversity. All right, so, so where are we, Jason? Uh, as you can see here, this is, uh, this is the famous gates where they, this is uh, where my tie yard, I had a, a uh, tie yard here, you know. Um, this is where I got raided for the start of the, uh, the McIntyre undercover, you know, program that... But, I mean, you, you lost all of this, didn't you? I mean, there is, a, oh. there is a cost to all of this, isn't there? You know, the fact that you lost your business and, and what did you lose? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, I had, um, it's now an MOT station, but uh, <coughs> when I had it, it was a tyre shop, I, it, you know, my big trade was uh, part worn tyres, but I had two recovery trucks, um, you know. Well, you know, one stood me in like eight grand, and another stood me in like 13 or 14 grand, you know what I mean? You know, they was on the, on the road uh, 
constantly, you know, if they wasn't on the road, um, I, 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 had a, I was getting a lot of work out of a firm and I was picking up their cars from, um, from the auction because they would, they would carry two cars each. So I would, uh, so <laughs> not only did I lose, people lost their jobs. You know, I had a, I had a kid, uh, you know, uh, Aaron who worked for me, I had two, two geezers driving the trucks for me. And if they wasn't picking up the motors uh, from, from there, they was picking up scrap, scrap uh, cars. I was running the, the motors in, obviously, and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd get the boats off of them, you know. I'd, I'd have the tyres and repair them or whatever, and as long as they was good, you know, uh, I'd sell them as part-worn tyres, you know. Uh, so, I mean, if he basically he comes in and does the, a, a job on you and then there's a huge aftermath of prison and people losing jobs and everything, you know. Yeah, of course, and, you know, I mean, uh, what people don't understand is, or they, they obviously they're not going to portray this on, on the documentary, is they, they had, a, they pretended that they had a courier company um, that they used for illegality but I can't say it on here, but you know, you know, I will plug my book. And it's in my book because uh, it's gone through all the solicitors and the legality. So it, it can be read in the book, it's only a game. But, you know, basically they offered me, they asked me to give them a price on their, on their courier company for their tires. You know, obviously I wanted no tires because they had no vans. So I give them a price and I got the contract. Now I had a tire shop, so why would I not want to get work and get paid from straight work as that's what my living is or my livelihood or part of my livelihood you know so um but people behind the scenes don't know this they don't know that you know because um they wasn't in the courtroom they haven't read the book and you know they haven't seen the 344 hours worth of video footage on me so uh, they only see the one hour that was exposed on BBC prime time, I must say, and uh, there were seven and a half million viewers, which, to be honest, I'm quite happy about because we beat EastEnders that night. So, I mean, how bitter are you about sort of losing that business that you set up? You know, to be honest with you, look, onwards and upwards, you know, I always, another one of my mottos is good follows bad, you know, I'm a bit of a strong character, you know. Uh, you know, what can you do? There's no point. At the time, I was fuming, you know, like, when I was in Wandsworth Hall, I wanted, I just wanted my recovery trucks to be, but, but the council got them and they crushed them because they didn't have tax on them. You know, fucking hell, they come with a right few quid, you know what I mean? You know, but that's all right. But as long as he's all right, you know, they, you know, but it's a fucking liberty, really. But, you know, there's nothing I can do about people losing their fucking jobs. You know, I'm swagged, I'm away, and I'm behind the door. Um, What's the sort of personal cost afterwards? Because I mean, you come out and your business has been decimated, as it were, and you've got to start again. How tough is all of that? Well, it's, you know, listen, it's a fucking lot of money. I wouldn't want to tell you what I fucking lost. I've got to tell you, you know, I was earning good money. I was getting good money out of uh, out of picking up these cars for for a massive company, by the way, that that, that would phone me up, that would phone me up, and uh, you know, say they've got 20 cars at the auction. Can I go and pick them up? Mm -hmm. You know. Fucking hell, do you know what I mean? And I was getting, you know, and that would be, you know, I might go and pick up 50 cars from during the week. Okay, sometimes I might go and pick up, you know, but anyway, these things happen, do you know what I mean? Um, so it's kind of, uh, kind of weird being outside the place that you were running and, you know, seeing it and it's, it not being yours. Well, it was mine. Let me tell you one thing. The, the, the fucking, the, the, the Indian that owned it, fuck me. I had my caravan, I had my trailer in the back there and, uh, and I'm in the, and I'm, you know, I, I was talking to uh, the old Bill didn't like it, but obviously, you know, as soon as they've come and what have you, and I, I said a few things in Romani to the fucking, to, to the kid who works for me and all that, so the old Bill didn't understand what I was saying, you know what I mean? And they oh, you fucking old that. I said, I know, but while I'm eating Edgehog Pie in Wandsworth tonight, I said, you'll be on your fucking three quid an hour, well done. Do you know what I mean? But when I had my trailer in the fucking, in, in the back, and, you know, they, they, they found a, they found a, um, uh, a phone book in there. And they said, you know, fucking hell, you've got, you know, you've got Howard Marks' number and Freddie Foreman's, Pretty Roy Shaw's, Dave Courtney's, you know, uh, you know, going, you know, Carl Leach, you know, boom, 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 going for all these fucking people's numbers. Do you know what I mean? You know, and I said, well, you know, I would do, it's a phone book. <laughs> fucking, I don't mean no harm, what am I meant to have in the phone book? You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, you know, obviously I had, I had, you know, a lot of other people in there as well, you know. 
and they took it for evidence and I don't know what evidence and I've never got any of it back and they said and they took the trailer and you know so you lose the trailer then you lose the thing but as I'm getting nicked he's putting the bolts on the on the thing because he you know do you know what I mean he's but anyway it don't matter you know because I give a few quid to get in there in the first place mm. so anyway it's not a problem we retrieved it and uh, I got a few quid back for the gaff when I come out but anyway that's neither near nor there